Water power swallowing, water bottle don't bother with it. Politicians, politics flowing like it's bottomless. Started it and finished it, water needed to swim in it. More valuable than oil, be careful homie, you spilling it. Welcome, beloved community, to another Water Wednesday show by the People's Water Board Coalition. Um, I am uh, grateful today to be with my friend Cindy. She, uh, Cindy Roper, she's the Senior Policy Advocate with the Natural Resources Defense Council, also known as NRDC, and she's a PWBC um, uh, volunteer. And thank you so much for being on the show, Cindy. Thank you for the opportunity. It's always great to talk about water and especially when we're amongst friends and certainly the People's Water Board Coalition has been at the forefront of a lot of these water fights over the years. So really appreciate the opportunity. I was so excited when you told me about the filter first uh, bills that are being pushed um, in uh, to lawmakers uh, this week, specifically after four long years. Um, it was it seems like such an important thing. Uh, for especially for parents, <laughs> it's going to give them such peace of mind. So do you want to tell us about the filter first law um, bill rather and, um, you know, why it's so important? Sure. So Michigan is about to set the national high water mark, so to speak, for protecting kids from lead in schools and child care centers. Very exciting by um, enacting law, uh, law that will basically require schools to put filters on all designated drinking water outlets as same at, at the same at child care centers. So basically we are skipping a whole step that um, other states and other communities are doing, which is uh, going out and testing for lead in the drinking water and then chasing the lead around. And then eventually if they find where the lead is coming from, doing sometimes really costly upgrades to their school's drinking water system so that they are, you know, trying to remove the lead, the, the components, the pipes, the fixtures, the fittings. And, you know, the problem with that is that lead releases variably from the, within the water. And right, you can test it one day and not find it and test it another day and it be there. It depends. That's on exactly it's, right. right. Okay. That's exactly right. And so what we are doing in Michigan is basically skipping that whole what we call test and chase approach and going straight to getting a protective barrier between the kids and the lead that we know is in the water if we look for it. Right. So that's what's really um, important about what's happening here. And it's also more cost effective. You're not wasting that money. You're going straight to putting that protection in place. Right. You're just assuming that the lead's in the water. That's right. That's right. Mm, that way you're not um, you're not spending money and wasting time on that. You're able to just immediately protect the children, which as a parent seems so important to me. And it may, it, you know, I wish that we would have had this years and years and years ago, those protections years and years and years ago. And, um, you know, like this was four years in the making and it's, it's beyond time. <laughs> right. Yes. You know, um, why was it so important to focus on, on schools and daycares? What do, um, you know, yeah. Why, yeah. why is it just focused on, on schools and daycares? Well, you know, first of all, kids spend many hours at schools and in child care centers. In fact, Michigan law requires each school district to annually provide um, literally 1,080 hours of instruction um, for kids over a certain you know, number of days each year. And then in child care centers, you have kids who are there even longer because often they're dropped off when the parents go to work. They're picked up when the parents are off of work yeah. and they are also um, year round schedules as compared to the schools being you know, just for a certain set of days. So and the reason this is so important for that population is that um, even though lead is toxic to everyone, infants and young children are at the greatest risk for lead poisoning because their brains and their bodies are rapidly developing and they more easily absorb the lead than those of older children. And so even at low levels, uh, exposure can interfere with thought processes, it can lower a child's IQ, and it can cause attention and behavioral problems, all of which can affect a lifetime of learning. So it's very important, as you noted, this has been going on for decades. We have generations of people who have experienced this in, in their schools 
and you know some in child care centers as well if they were in child care and you know it's just time as you said to get it done because these are our most vulnerable um, you know individuals when it comes to the effects of lead on their body and it's also <clears throat> unfortunate that this exposure is happening in places where they're going to learn and to develop and to be able to grow um, and this is the opposite of what we want to see happening in those spaces. Yeah. And as a parent, we want to see those spaces safe for our children, right? It's so um, it, it, the peace of mind of that for Michiganders, for parents um, in Michigan is, uh, is going to be just astronomical. It's going to make people feel so much better about sending their kids there. I, um, I can't wait for everybody to learn about this and celebrate it um, and celebrate the work that um, has been done. You know, we we need to throw throw you a party for sure. Oh well, there there were many <laughs> a whole bunch of people, right? Involved, yes. Um, there All were, the there different were a lot organizations and things that uh, were involved in it. Uh, we should celebrate because we don't get to celebrate all the time. A lot of time we talk about, uh, especially when we're talking about lead and water. We you know like Flint and Benton Harbor places like that where people have really seriously been harmed. Whole communities have been harmed, right? That's right. And, you know, that's why I think Michigan is at the forefront of a lot of these protections that are being yeah. put forward, um, whether it's that we were the first state to require that all lead service lines, the pipe that connects the water main to the home, uh, be replaced all the way to the home. And then it be done as a part of our overall business of getting safe water into the home and that individual homeowners and residents are not charged for the portion of the pipe that pipe that is under private property. Um, we, you know, we took the first steps on that. We took the first steps on um, making sure that we don't do partial lead right. service line replacements, which has been the practice. So uh, this is yet another measure, but it comes off of the tragedies that have taken place, as you noted, in Flint and Benton Harbor and in other communities throughout the state. Yeah. So um, it, <laughs> I, it does make sense that Michigan would step right up and say, oh, yeah, we don't want this to keep happening. And it, it feels good that uh, that people are doing that work. It's so good. Where can people go to learn more about it? Um, I know that we're going to put a link to a blog that you wrote um, in in the description box. But we want it. Where can people go to learn more about it? Well, I think in that blog, there are links to other resources that can be um you know, pursued. What we won't see quite yet is information like on the state of Michigan's website, because the state of Michigan so far has been part of this test and chase approach. It's a voluntary program. There is no national requirement that schools test and that they then do something about the lead okay. in school drinking water, shockingly. And yeah. so um, we are we we have been working with the state uh, program that promotes that approach for several years now in anticipation of these bills becoming law. So pretty soon we should have more information. But for right now, a lot of the information that's available would be through things like the blog post. And um, there are some, you know, news articles that have been out there, but it's sort of, that's why I'm really excited to be here for the show is that it's not been uh, as visible yeah, as a lot of the other about. fights. I, it hasn't have, been I know all about. about water and I didn't know anything about it. And I yeah. get to hang out with you. <laughs> right, right. And so I think that, you know, we've we've built bipartisan support for this legislation so over great. the past four years. Um, it is based on a model bill that NRDC developed about a little over four years ago. And so, you know, it's been kind of a methodical bipartisan effort to make sure that we got the support that we needed. And in the end, we did have strong bipartisan support for these bills. And they are two of the, there are three bills and two of them have already gone to the governor's desk. And we expect the third one could go as soon as today. And meaning that it's completely finished and she just needs to sign those bills. Well, I can't wait to keep our viewers updated on that. As soon as it goes through, uh, we'll put it out on our social media so that uh, folks can check it out uh, and see um, and celebrate with us. It's such, it's such an amazing time and moment, uh, for, especially for water warriors and people who do this work like you. Um, it's so wonderful. Do you have any final thoughts? What else do people need to know? 
Well, I, maybe talk. A, I can talk a little bit about how the approach works. So, um, you know, I, I mentioned that we sort of skip the test and chase approach, but what, what happens is that each school and childcare center will have to develop its own, what we call a drinking water, like safety plan, so that they will determine where these um, outlets that are filtered will be located. And, it, you know, there, there's no one size fits all. Every school has to figure that out. And you want to make sure they're in places that are convenient, but also maybe not at the end of the line, so to speak, for the plumbing, because you want to make sure the water is circulating as much as possible, even with the filters. It's a good idea to think about where you're putting those filters. And then all of the other water outlets, whether they're faucets or anything else, will either be labeled as not available for drinking and it would be done in a way that like small children would understand an image means don't drink this water, um, right. or they will be taken offline. Um, if it's a like a, a water fountain that doesn't have a filter on it, we don't want to keep those going at the same time that we have filtered water stations out there. Yeah, it can't be confusing for the kids. It cannot be confusing. And, you know, again, no amount of lead is safe. And yeah. so our, the, the legislation really pushes to keep the levels below one part per billion, which is basically detecting lead. And right now in many schools, even with the voluntary program, the level that is considered not actionable is much higher. It can be 15, 20 parts per billion. So mm -hmm. that's like 15 or 20 times more than what is um, deemed to be, uh, you know, safe. Yeah. So uh, in, in addition, there will be sampling. So here's the thing, the testing will still take place, but it will take place after filtration to make sure the filters are work. Most okay. places do it the other way around that sort of like look for the lead. And if they find it, then they might, you know, might have the money to do something about it. And they might not, you know, they might just right. have to take that outlet offline and, even though that may not be the only guilty outlet, um, again, based on how variable the release of lead is. And so um, there will be testing after filtration. If they find that a particular fountain is above one part mm -hmm. per billion, there are steps that will need to be taken. But again, the overall goal is to keep the lead out of the water completely and that that's how the program is designed. Yeah, and you talked a little bit about money. How do, I know you had to secure or folks had to secure funding for this, right? What was what kind of funding needed to be secured? Right. So um, actually, NRDC did a cost analysis, and you can find that again in the blog that you'll be posting, just to show the comparison between this approach and the traditional approach of like testing and chasing, and then possibly remediating, changing out the plumbing fixtures, etc., maybe filter filtration, but. Um, what our analysis showed is that, you, you know, we over a 10 year period of time, the, the, the amount that was needed was about um, $331 million less than would be needed if we did the traditional test and chase approach. Wow. And so in the first um, installment of funding for this program, we were able to secure $50 million, and that was bipartisan. It was through the Republican-controlled legislature in 2022. So we have $50 million kind of down payment on this program. We're now working to get additional resources and hopeful that we'll be able to get even additional um, funding coming into you know, this fall. Um, and so that's the other focus of our work. After these bills are passed, we're going to try to increase the funding and uh, encourage others to join in that effort and would be happy to connect with anyone about how we would want to make that happen. Very exciting. So such amazing work. For uh, Thank you to everybody who was involved to make this happen. Um, looking forward to putting out on our social media that um, that the governor has signed this and it's into law and all the things. I'm just so looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Cindy. I appreciate you. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to talk about this and to share the, the good news with everyone. Yeah, yeah, because we don't always get to share good news, so I like it. That's right. Um, well, I want to I uh, thank our behind-the-scenes tech person, Angelica. I couldn't do this work without you, um, or we couldn't do this work without you. Thank you. You're doing an amazing job. And I'd like to thank uh, Will C. He gave us this amazing song called Water Power, to use for our intro and outro for the Water Wednesday webcast. So we want to thank Will C for that. And I want to thank all of our viewers. Um, thank you for the support. 
throughout the years. It's been three years and I'm looking forward to another three more years of talking about water struggles and justice issues um, throughout Michigan and throughout the United States. So thank you viewers so much. Try to look out for each other, try to take care of each other and try to stay afloat. Till next time. Bye. Started it and finished it, water needed to swim in it, more valuable than oil. Be careful, homie, you're spilling it. <laughs>